Kelly Knight uh, QC is uh, speaking with us today. Uh, we also, our other most important co-host are the Highly Skilled UK group, which are the group of remaining people whose um, indefinite leave to remain has been denied um, on the basis of tax discrepancies. Um, we have the amazing Secretariat who seem to have unlimited energy to support those who've been through the many hundreds, well, the many hundreds who've been through the, the same cases as them, sometimes from their own pocket as well. So we'll be looking forward to hearing them later. And we also very, very warmly welcome Lord Woolley, Lord Simon Woolley, who we are looking forward uh, for him to share his great wisdom and expertise in identifying and working for greater racial justice and equality in the UK. Um, and I'll explain them a bit more in a bit. Just wanted to share with everybody uh, the main findings of, of the report. Um, these issues that are faced by highly skilled migrants, they're not isolated. I really, having investigated um, extensively over the past six months, um, really do think they're part of a wider picture and pattern of discrimination. Um, and it's yet another group of Commonwealth migrants of colour who are targeted disproportionately by Home Office policy. Um, we have seen from Lord William Davis's investigations that paperwork has been weaponized against Windrush migrants and from my investigations over the past six months, including through extensive surveys and interviews, uh, Migrants Rights Network believes that the same is happening here to this community. Um, the highly skilled term refers to the name of the tier one visa set up by by the Labour government in 2008. It was shut down in 2014 under Theresa May as Home Secretary. Um, this was quite unexpected <laughs> for many of those people on that scheme. They understood when they chose to come to the UK as highly skilled, um, highly skilled people um, that this would be a five, ten year route to settlement and they could build a family and a life here in the UK. In around 2016, some of the highly skilled migrants started to notice a pattern in Home Office decisions um, of being denied on the basis of tax discrepancies from one pound to thousands of pounds, um, but they noticed there was this new use of um, good character references that were being used against them to deny them to stay in the UK. And they spoke online and on LinkedIn and Facebook and formed this highly skilled UK group who we have with us today. Um, at the time, they found over 1,000 people um, had been denied in this group for indefinite leave to remain for non-criminal tax offences. This has reduced to around 70 cases now, with about 200 people still affected. Uh, and these are cases that have fallen through the cracks, or I perceive that the Home Office is particularly keen not to um, resolve these cases or, or allow indefinite leave to remain. These guys, um, all of them have been in the UK for 10 or more years, some up to 17 years. 75% have children. Um, notably, all of the remaining cases are uh, people of colour from six Commonwealth countries. That's mostly Pakistan, over half, India, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. 90% um, have postgraduate degrees from the UK and 25% have MBAs. So, um, yeah. These guys are the highly skilled um, people that the, the UK really wanted to welcome in uh, back in around 2010. Um, and they are trained as what would now be NHS frontline workers. Some are IT consultants for embassies, some are biomedical scientists, others are factory production managers. They have a whole host of, um, of jobs that they did do. In 2019, uh, the Balajagari judgment, which was a big judgment for this case, found that it was unlawful that the Home Office had not given an opportunity to explain the tax discrepancies. 80% of the remaining cases have still not had an opportunity through responding to minded to refuse letters, um, which are an opportunity where the Home Office lists everything that has been um, people are accused of and in some cases even these are really problematic because they've expanded the scope of uh, the tax discrepancies and they've started digging into other parts of the person's life um, to more questions beyond the, the, the immediate discrepancy issue. Um, so 80% have not had the opportunity to respond to such letters and one in five have not even had a chance for appeal and in lots of the remaining cases there is a heavy reliance on the initial home office decision. Um, the decisions in court have been very inconsistent. In um, many cases as well with the Home Office, there hasn't been evidence of a balancing exercise, which means um, that you take all the relevant circumstances into account of the person, um, including how long they've been in the UK, 
um, kind of characteristics, disabilities, etc. So um, yeah, that that's apparently necessary according to the Balajagari judgment and has not necessarily been done in lots of the cases. Um, and it's hit and miss whether some of those can bring the have been able to bring new evidence forward as well. Where are we now? Um, some have the right to work, um, but over half, 55%, have no right to work, to rent uh, any property, to access the NHS, or have access to public funding. So NRPF comes up here again with this community. The impact has been really, really huge. We'll hear that today. Um, nearly half have gone from normal life to actual destitution or homelessness, uh, living in one room or on a friend's sofa with children. They don't have enough to afford to live and there's significant stress related health issues at a very young age, heart attacks, strokes, etc. Uh, some of which are life changing. Um, some also have complex needs and um, characteristics such as autistic children or other disabilities as well. Um, in one case, because there was no access to um, the NHS, I learned the other day that uh, one of the couple, one of the people had to, with his wife, give birth to their son in the home by themselves because they were not allowed to access the NHS, which I can imagine was deeply stressful. Um, this highly skilled migrant policy, I, I also, for my investigations, do not believe that it meets the Home Office policy objectives, which is to reduce numbers in the UK of people, um, of migrants. There are many most of them, a few, one or two have given up and have just gone home, uh, or gone, gone to where um, they were coming from originally. And then um, everybody else has stayed to fight their case, resolute to, to fight it. So then that tactic hasn't worked. Um, and without the right to work as well, local authorities um, and potentially even by extension, the taxpayer have had to pay for the support of those who've been pushed into homelessness and destitution where there is nowhere else to turn. Um, after the Balajagari judgment, the big court case in 2019, uh, the, which found that the Home Office had acted unlawfully, uh, there was a scramble to settle cases and that has really reduced the number, but now we are talking about the remaining 70 or so cases at least, uh, and there will be more around the UK um, that have fallen through the cracks. So our recommendations to the Home Office include um, ending the use of the 3225 good character clause um, for things that are not criminal, like tax discrepancies. Um, we also want to make sure that all the human rights circumstances are considered in the cases and that a balancing exercise is applied to all the cases left. Um, we also call for the highly skilled migrants to be able to work, rent and have access to public funds while they're waiting for their decision, their application to be decided on. Um, and particularly now because of COVID, um, we, we're asking for emergency support because it, the situation has got pretty desperate um, during the pandemic and there's all sorts of issues with access to medicine, etc. Um, and housing. Um, also, we, we're really calling for there to be uh, for immediate reconsideration of the remaining cases, especially where there hasn't been an opportunity to explain the discrepancies or to take the full circumstances seriously. And um, we are also um, calling for the Home Office to um, give indefinite leave to remain, not just 30 months leave to remain. What we found is that um, the person might be believed at the end of the day, that there was no tax discrepancy or they weren't being, uh, they weren't being dishonest on purpose. But what we find is that um, they're only being given 30 months leave to remain, which they then have to keep paying for every 30 months. So we're asking for that to end. So these highly skilled migrant issues are not isolated. Um, for those of you on the call working in the immigration sector, they are part of a same story that we've seen with other migrants. Um, this is part of the same move to have a cross-governmental enforcement of a hostile or compliant environment. And there are many questions that remain for other migrants, including the EU TOEIC, TOEIC students, Windrush uh, migrants as well, around the criminalization and the use of good character references, determining that people are undesirable to stay in the UK. And it's also not clear how long this is held over them. For many of these people, it's been over 10 years now, and yet criminal charges can be dropped after 10 years. So we're wondering why are these not being dropped? Um, these cases also set a really worrying precedent for using a points-based system, application process and system, which seems to retrospectively punish people for not living up to the standards that even British citizens are expected to. So in the minute, I'll introduce our other speakers. Um, but just wanted to share with you all as well that 
um, we've had coverage in The Guardian, The Independent and Sky News is about to publish information on this case as well. And because of that, the Home Office has made a statement in response. And I'll just pick out a couple of things that they said that includes equating these cases to Windrush is wrong and inflammatory. Um, they've reviewed and said that um, that most of the cases now are £10,000 discrepancy or higher, and these are not small mistakes. So I think they're attempting to justify why, why they're not letting so many people stay in the UK. Um, from what I understand, 88%, that's quite a high number from the Home Office. I think it's actually like quite a few are under that number. But even if that was an arbitrary threshold, um, I have questions that I'd love to carry on with everybody about why does this make you more inherently guilty than other people? It doesn't negate that a subjective moral judgment that criminalizes you for a non-criminal act is, has been applied. For 83% of these guys, it was their first ever tax return in the UK. Um, I have to do self-employment tax returns. They're incredibly complicated. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies in 2017 found that there is some form of discrepancy in almost 60% of self-employed tax returns in the UK. So uh, it seems that we're punishing these guys very harshly. The Home Office also said, we are working to resolve these outstanding cases fairly and as quickly as possible, which of course we welcome and we will be following up on that. And they say, those awaiting the outcome of their application are not destitute. They have been granted permission to study or work while their cases are reconsidered. I will let you decide um, when you hear from the other guys today whether, whether or not that is the case. I, I think, um, yeah, maybe they're not up to date with, with the current situation. Um, final note, would very warmly welcome working with any of you on the call. Thank you once again for, for joining us today. Um, Anybody who's working on relevant strategic litigation or policy issues would love to speak further with you. My email should be in the name uh, that I have on my video um, and it will also be sent out with the report that we'll, we'll send to you as well. Um, this, uh, this kind of joint working across different, working with different migrant communities, Windrush and EU and TOEIC and especially with the highly skilled migrants, this hasn't quite been joined up yet and, and done. So it'd be really wonderful to to kind of compare notes and understand and listen to, to different people for that and would love to take that forward. Um, there's all sorts of court issues and court decisions that are problematic at the moment, I think that will have impact for other migrants, including there's a recent judgment that kind of almost reverses the burden of proof to be believed for these kind of discrepancies. Um, for example, now you have to bring your accountant to court maybe kicking and screaming. I'm not sure which accountant would actually want to want to stand up in court and admit that they they're incompetent. So um, all of this, I think, before I hand over to our first speaker, Lord Woolley, all of this really, for me, raises questions about what kind of country do we want to be? How do we emerge on the post-Brexit international stage, including with our Commonwealth partners? Um, and again, all of these guys are from the Commonwealth. How do we ensure that everyone, including those committed to no those who have committed no criminal act can be treated fairly and live with dignity as they deserve in this country. I very, very warmly now, because I have spoken for too long, hand over to Lord Simon Woolley. He is the founder and director of Operation Black Vote, which seeks to ensure that we have greater racial justice and equality throughout the UK. And he is the trustee also of Charity Police Now. Um, Lord Woolley has been a cross bench member of the House of Lords since October 2019 and he was the chair of the UK Government Race Disparity U Unit Advisory Group until last July. Um, please, if there are any questions to Lord Woolley or to Stephen Timms, who will speak afterwards, um, please do uh, put them in the chat and then we can ask them. Lord Woolley. Thank you very much, Catherine. And good afternoon to everyone. I, I have to say, uh, Catherine, that it, there's not a better time for, for you, for us to raise this issue about these uh, highly skilled migrant workers. Um, I would just like to draw everyone's attention back to this time last week. This time last week was Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And many of us on this call uh, celebrated that day because we all knew that Dr. Martin Luther King had more than a dream, he had a plan. And step one of that plan was to politically empower African Americans to be in a situation where they're not asking for justice and equality, but can demand it. Uh, on the day that King was 
murdered. He was on his way to give uh, a march for the wider American society, poor people who had no voice and little say. And so he wanted all Americans, black and white, to come together to unite, to fight for justice. So a week later, on the celebratory birthday, that we are here fighting for justice, fighting for those that are often most vulnerable in our society to demand decency. And first of all, I want to thank you, Catherine. I mean, uh, I call myself a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King, but I think you are too. Uh, it seems to me you have a, a great amount of energy and passion, um, working hard, bringing people together. But I would also say too that all of you on this call are activists fighting for social and racial justice. Otherwise, I don't think you'd be here. And I think that you're not just here to listen, we're here to learn, but we're also here to act. I wish I could see you all. I can see some of your names, Abby, Abbas, Abu, uh, um, Alexandra, I'm gonna scroll down, Barry, Bea, Bonnie, Catherine, Kathy, David, you know, Farouk, over a hundred of you, activists. And it's together that we must demand action uh, in the Martin Luther King spirit. So that's the first thing I, I, I want to impart to you. The, the second thing is, although we are focusing on highly skilled migrants, I mean, the way that I see this is a pattern from this government. It's not just this particular sector. Um, I, maybe like Stephen Timms, were, were, were in our various chambers uh, looking at the domestic abuse bill, fighting for those migrant women, that some of them are, are most vulnerable in society, who have no recourse to public funds, and yet are the most country. And few people are speaking on their, for their plight. And of course, the wider context is Windrush. They said in that debate, Catherine, that we shouldn't conflate Windrush uh, with migrant women and their plight, but we should and we must, because there is a trajectory. Think about this for a second, that the heartache of Windrush, my mother's generation, my mother came here in the 1950s and gave her best uh, adult years to the National Health Service. Her back is in a dreadful uh, state, as are her knees, because they used to put people over the back and take them out, out, of their, out of the beds to look after them. That generation, there's a backbone, the backbone of post-war society, were treated so badly, so badly on technicalities. And the government said this, well, this was awful, these were dreadful mistakes, and they must never happen again. We must learn the lessons of the way we treat people in our society. And yet you, Catherine, and Stephen, and I, have laid bare how other people, they happen to be again people of color, are treated shabbily, shockingly, with no respect, with no dignity. What is a response from a government? Denial. And I think it says to me that the lessons learned from Windrush have not been taken seriously. And there's not that genuine, that genuine honestness that says we must do things different. What, what I find astonishing about all of this is that, is that here we are in a time, in a time when a nation needs to unleash the best it, it has. And if you, as, as you have outlined, Catherine, I mean, these individuals have great skills. And here we are in an awful pandemic when we need everybody in our society pulling together. And yet these, these individuals, these wonderful individuals, have been thrown under the bus. And I might add too, what does it send out to the wider uh, world in a, in a, a Brexit Britain, uh, which is said to 500 million uh, European partners, individuals in that group, we're not going to do business with you, then how was the rest of the world going to think 
when we're treating migrant workers in this way. Oh, oh, and by the way, as you highlighted, all of those, all of those are non-white. We talked about the Commonwealth, it's not the Canadians, it's not the New Zealanders, it's not Canada, uh, it, is, it is those uh, that look like you and I, on many of you on, on this call. What is the response? How do we respond? Well, we take that Martin Luther King spirit and we make our demands. First and foremost, Catherine, I would argue that we sow a golden thread, that you say to me, my struggle is yours, yours is mine. We say to those migrant skilled workers, your struggle is my struggle. And we get others around the country to join that collective voice and make those demands. We don't rest until every politician in this country knows about this issue, that we link it to Windrush and we use it as a set of demands. And finally, I would say this, look, there's elections around the corner. There's elections around the corner for the local elections and mayoral, mayoral elections, make this an issue. As you said, Catherine, this is about who we are, about what we care about, about who we are as a society. And if we cannot look after the most vulnerable, who have the least amount of rights, then who can? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Lord Woolley. That was very moving and very inspiring and absolutely want to take this forward across the country. And thank you for the, the heads up on the local government elections as well. Um, I immediately hand over to Right Honourable Stephen Timms, who is the Member of Parliament for East Ham, uh, formerly Newham North since 1994. And he was the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, from 2006 to 2007. And now he chairs the APPG for Immigration Law and Practice and has worked extensively on no access to public funds and all kinds of issues um, related to these topics today, not least because of um, his East Ham constituent members. And I think he might be the MP who still holds the most constituencies per week. I've heard rumours that it's still six a week at the moment. Um, and I apologise to Ali on the call. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> so I, I hand over to Stephen now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for inviting me. And I very much agree with everything that Simon has just said. Uh, we, we set up this new all-party parliamentary group on immigration law and policy uh, three or four months ago and we set it up to examine jointly legislators and practitioners the challenges uh, in immigration law and practice including looking at some of the regulatory barriers and hurdles that migrants in the UK are facing and for our recently formed group. It's a, a feather in our cap to be supporting the launch of, of this important report today. At the inaugural meeting of the group, um, I, I talked about my worries over the government's approach to migration policy. Everybody now accepts, as Simon has just reminded us, that the treatment by the Home Office of the Windrush generation was a disgrace. There's been a government apology, compensation scheme has been Put in place and we've seen the Windrush Lessons Learned review published and that highlights very starkly some of the deep problems in policy and in culture which are pervasive in the Home Office. The Home Secretary accepted the findings of that review, she promised to implement its recommendations in full uh, the Home Office set out what it said were its intentions in a comprehensive improvement plan published in September last year, which is a pretty striking document with a full-hearted en endorsement from the Home Secretary in her foreword, and it makes some very encouraging promises. Writing the wrongs, a more compassionate approach, opened us to scrutiny. Some of the headings in the document, and maybe uh, we thought there was going now to be some real change but nobody I know who's working with the consequences of Home Office policy has reported any sign of those commitments being translated into actual change and the fact that we're here today launching this report 
suggests that very little is changing uh, in its treatment of highly skilled migrants. The Home Office is not righting the wrongs, it is repeating the wrongs. And this assumption that people from overseas are probably crooks and cheats is exactly the assumption exposed by Wendy Williams, which caused the Windrush scandal in the first place. And, and here we are uh, again. One of the, the causes I've been pursuing for a while in Parliament because of what I've seen in my constituency surgeries is that of overseas students falsely accused by the American firm ETS of cheating in its TOEIC English language tests. The evidence against those students uh, is in most cases non-existent. There was some cheating going on, but nothing like on the scale that ETS claimed. Uh, and yet the, the Home Office has continued to pursue students, even when it's crystal clear, for example, that the student concerned can speak superb English. The treatment of highly skilled migrants documented here fits into this broader pattern of problematic policies that I've uh, seen in my constituency time and time again, regularly, disproportionately unfair treatment of migrants, including through these so-called good character judgments. And, and there are real questions anyway about what is proportionate, given that the discrepancies we're talking about are uh, generally minor and certainly are not criminal. I was a minister at the Treasury with tax responsibilities on four separate occasions. It is an important principle of our tax system. But once a mistake has been identified and owned up to and any additional tax due has been made, the matter is closed. The authorities do not come back with further sanctions unless there's some new information that comes to light subsequently. And the reason that is important is to make sure that there is a strong incentive for people to own up to mistakes once they've identified them and to pay the additional tax due. If, in fact, the system is likely to come back with more sanctions, possibly years after the event, then the incentive will be for people not to own up, but to cover up mistakes when they've made them. This is quite an important aspect of how our tax system is supposed to work. In the cases we're talking about here, people have owned up to mistakes, tax has been paid, HMRC has been completely satisfied frequently years ago. And then the Home Office comes back, uh, often years later, with more penalties, not demanding money, but turning down leave to remain applications on the grounds of alleged past cheating, sometimes destroying people's livelihoods, even breaking up families in a way that I think is wholly wrong and completely um, unfair. Um, decisions like this have had an extraordinarily damaging impact, very severe financial hardship, as Catherine has outlined, and I think we're going to hear uh, more about many people having to incur heavy debts to pay legal costs in order to establish their uh, innocence. Um, and again, as Catherine has mentioned, a lot of people in this situation have no recourse to public funds uh, as well. This NRPF condition on leave to remain uh, has had a particularly damaging impact in the pandemic when so many people have lost their work. I asked the Prime Minister about this policy at the Liaison Committee in May, and I asked him again about it a couple of weeks ago at the Liaison Committee. Um, his instinctive response in May was that people in that position, hardworking, law-abiding, should be able to get help of one kind or another. And I was pleased that was his instinctive reaction. I just wish it was the policy of his government. Uh, earlier this month, when I raised it again, he seemed to think the issue was about people here illegal, uh, illegally. In fact, we're talking about people who've been working legally, very often working extremely hard, often for many years, very often with children born in the UK, sometimes with children who are UK uh, citizens. I'm pleased that we do now have a bit more data on that policy. 
uh, and there's much wider awareness of the NRPF condition than ever before in Parliament and in the media, but there's been no change of policy at all. The no recourse to public funds condition should have been suspended for the duration of the uh, pandemic. But uh, health, people's health, uh, family relationships have been damaged, many pushed into destitution, sometimes homelessness, uh, not uh, allowed to, to work, despite what that Home Office uh, statement, Catherine Red uh, said, uh, to access public funding while their leave to remain applications are pending resulting often in costs borne by local authorities. In the case of no recourse to public funds, there is a, a process for exemption. It's slow, it's cumbersome, it's very hard to get through. So I, I hope that a lot of members of parliament in both houses will press the Home Office and other parts of the government on the issues that this report raises. In particular, whether highly skilled migrants with pending indefinite leave to remain applications can be granted the right to work in the UK and to visit family overseas while they wait. And I, I think a compensation scheme uh, ought to be looked at uh, as well. And as a former Treasury Minister, I would welcome clarification from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs about the use of historic, long since settled tax discrepancies amongst highly skilled migrants in future settlement or naturalization applications. Whether that is really uh, appropriate, I don't think it is, um, and whether the usual treatment of mistakes which have been corrected ought to be maintained, as I certainly think it should be, which means not coming back to them uh, years into the, the future. And, and this may well be a topic that uh, the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Immigration, Law and Practice want to come back uh, to and, and have another look at. So the report, I think, is raising very important concerns about the government's approach in chasing highly skilled migrants. They're undermining this route to a visa, denying hardworking entrepreneurial people and their families permission to live in the UK with the dignity that they ought to be entitled to. And let's not forget, and Simon has made this point, we have now left the European Union. We're going to be increasingly dependent on trading links in the very countries from which highly skilled migrants have come. We're not going to do well in developing those links if the Home Office keeps on giving the impression that it thinks people coming from those countries are probably cheats. So I warmly welcome this report and the work of the Migrant Rights Network, both in compiling the report and also, very importantly, in providing much needed support to those who've been targeted unfairly by this policy. And I hope we're going to see some changes following in policy as a result. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that. Um, absolutely lots of work to do. And if there are any MPs or staff on the call, um, we would be delighted to support you in putting uh, written questions forward or um, yeah, we'll be exploring all sorts of parliamentary mechanisms, I'm sure, to, to raise this issue. And thank you so much to Stephen for speaking so eloquently and with deep experience about the issues um, and a few more points that um, really gonna help the campaign there as well that I hadn't realized or thought of. So thank you so much. Um, just to everybody in the chat, there aren't any immediate questions. There is a few minutes now. If, if you do have any questions for uh, Lord Woolley and for Stephen, um, please do put them in the chat now. If, if there's not, uh, then we, we will move on and we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end. I know that Lord Woolley does need to, to, to leave us. There's lots of other important business he needs to, um, to work on today um, with tabling amendments, etc. I think in a committee. Um, and yeah, so we can we can come back and any questions that anybody has be, I'm sure you would both be um, happy to receive them. Um, AJ apparently has a, has a question re regarding the cost of visa. This is, we were hoping to keep it to the, um, to the chat. Um, AJ, I wonder if you, if you are there, if you can unmute and just ask your question very quickly. If it's a technical question, I might 
I might answer it a bit later. AJ, if you're there, do uh, do unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Just wanted to you know, ask regarding cost of visa. In they, they charge for, I already applied for three times and all the time they refused it. It cost me around 10,000 pounds. But it, it is too much. It's not even refundable. So it's like a gamble, you know, you have to play, whether you get it, you don't get it. And is there anything happening regarding cost of visa? Thank you so much, AJ. And just I'll pause on that question and then I'll just add as well um, from Victoria. Um, Victoria Morton, it's lovely to see you. Um, she was wondering if, um, as well as government, there's a role for business here to play in raising awareness and putting pressure on government. So that, that point about visas and that cost and who else can get involved beyond government? Um, Lord Woolley, I, if there's anything more you want to add as well on what Stephen said. I think the secondary question around business is really critical. I think that we've got to lobby vociferously the CBI and those progressive um, big businesses who, who want our talent, want the talent that is out there, um, particularly at, at this time. So I think, as you suggested, it's a multi-pronged attack. Uh, we've got to lay bare the facts, lobby, lobby the government, but work with those who will help us in that lobbying space. If big business says, look, we need this, we need, we have a skill shortage and we need uh, these, these workers, then that's going to put pressure. And I think that type of business pressure will resonate uh, quite strongly uh, with, with this government. So it's about us being smart. I mean, there's the moral argument, the heartbreaking argument, frankly. I mean, the, 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 um, the questioner said, that you know, basically they're playing lottery. They're, they're spending thousands of pounds not knowing if there's remotely going to be any success. I mean, who would do that? Why, why is that happening? So I guess, Stephen, you and I have got to ask these questions. We've got to find, we've got to find friends in the treasury because it, 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 there are some that I think we can have conversations with. There are others, particularly in the home office, that are like this. I mean. Some of them, I'm not going to mention any names, shame us, shame us. Uh, others in government, I think we can find traction. And so it's about being smart and, and about being together. And I am sorry that I've got to, I've got to leave. I, you know, Stephen, I used to hate meetings when I was an activist and you'd invite a politician and then they would come for half an hour and then leave. Now I understand <laughs> that the diary, you, you, you get called to do so many things and you don't want to say no. Um, but can I, can I just, I want to leave you with that Martin Luther King spirit. I really do. Because I know, I know that many of you, you know, are at the coalface and it seems hopeless. It seems, you know, I'm not, good, I'm not getting any further. Uh, that every step you, that you take gets us to a better place. And sometimes even when you lose, you win. Um, I've learned that. I'm sure Stephen has too. So it, I want you to carry that. And this is... This is for the people that you're representing and for all of us. It's a marathon, not a spring. Thank you so much, Lord Woolley. Um, yeah, amazingly inspiring. Thank you so much. We will carry that spirit with us um, definitely across the rest of the day and, and throughout the weeks. And thank you so much for your support and absolutely look forward to following up um, as well. Thank you and good luck with everything else you, you have today. Uh, Stephen. Well, I, I very much agree with what Feynman has just said. I, on the point about visa fees, I think it is clear they are now excessive, um, significantly higher than can be justified on any basis that, that I would recognise, or I think that anyone <clears throat> on this call would accept. Um, the visa fees themselves and then the NHS surcharges as well. Um, unfortunately, there isn't any sign that I've seen of any willingness in government to reduce them at the moment. So for the time being, we seem to be stuck with these at the level they're at, or and indeed, you know, they've they've continued to to rise. But I I I don't think the current level can be um, can be defended. Thank you, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, th I can see there's other questions coming in, and we'll I think we'll come back to them. There's really really great points around a public inquiry and these are all sorts of suggestions that we can 
uh, we can follow up on and we can discuss later as well. Stephen, are you able to stay around till the end? I'm not sure whether you... Uh, I, I'm here until um, half past. Okay, so... So no, 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 okay, I'm a bit later than that. I've got another half hour, half hour. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, well, and I think, by the way, just as a side point, that there's also definite room to get other the business community involved. I think there's conversations to have at Bayes. Um, these are highly skilled people and it's a question of, you know, what do we want the UK to look like post, post Brexit as well. Um, but we must leave time now to, to hear from some of those who have been directly affected. I know that Amar and B are on the line as well. Um, B, I wonder um, if you, I'll let you introduce yourself in some ways by telling your story. Thank you so much for your, um, your courage to, to come and speak to us today. And um, yeah, we'll hand over to you, B. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Teams and uh, Catherine and everyone and Sonali for all your support. We are very, very grateful as highly skilled migrants. Um, I've listened to Lord Duhuli and um, I hope I'll be able to remain composed and I'm going to read what I uh, prepared. Uh, I came to the UK having worked, uh, having lived for the greater part of my life in a former British colony. I held various senior management roles and I came here uh, to study for him, uh, an MSc degree. I worked with international humanitarian organizations in the banking sector and tertiary education, holding high posts you know, of authority and decision making. I excelled in school. I wrote Cambridge examinations when I was in my country. And I knew when I came to this country that it would be a perfect fit with my education and remarkably similar values. I was brought up to believe that the British justice system is based on fairness and compassion. I had no doubt then that I would make a model citizen and excel in whatever path I chose in the UK. And I know to date, I've lived to that. My text discrepancy, it emanated from not declaring dividends to HMRC. I rectified the error once it was pointed to me before I made my application for the IRL. The Home Office did not accept my explanations, and I feel that the judgment is so disproportionate and unjust to the mistakes I made. And it just brings me back to how I've always brought about to think about the British uh, justice system. My case started in 2016. And five years down the road, I'm nowhere near resolution. Before the Balajigari judgment, the Home Office had refused my right to work for 22 months. But because of that judgment, they were able to review my case and reinstate my Section 3C that you can see that it wasn't just the admission to restore my section 3c they realized that they'd made a mistake but for 22 months i was out of work fast forward i had a consent order and my right to work was reinstated last year in february i was given a minded to refuse later and it came back with more other stories and I've given that my application was subsequently uh, refused and I'm waiting for a date to go to the first tier tribunal. So five years down the road, I'm not sure where I'm going. How has this all impacted on my life? The anxiety, the depression of this arduous court and home office processes I know guys, you say you do understand, but at times I don't think people do understand. It is just nerve wracking. It is soul destroying. It is energy sapping. I've been on long-term medication to manage depression, insomnia, and anxiety. And that ever looming threat to be uprooted from a community and life that I've established since I came to the UK in 2007, is daunting. 
am ever on my nerves edge as I dread hearing from my solicitors or oh, still immigration enforcement teams turning on my doorstep unannounced for removal. The thought of a removal gives me panic attacks and I just feel the process is very, very unfair and so disproportionate. My life has been on hold in so, so many ways. I wanted to enroll for further studies as a PhD student. Even my current employer, he wants to support me, but they cannot. The uncertainty of the immigration status has just stalled everything. I thrive on undertaking various projects at any given point in time. And that failure to enroll, a fa you know, for further studies just deprives me to reach my potential. I will share with you one thing that I think is very important as well. My employment under the COVID-19 pandemic. I have a great job in contributing immensely to the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. During my work, I'm at a high risk of exposure to COVID-19 due to the work settings I work in. I'm a designated key worker and my organization drives improvement in health and social care settings to minimize the risk of harm to people in patients with COVID-19. It is a job that is immense responsibility to ensure organizations are following in and prevention guidance, amongst many other regulations we regulate. I visit settings with non-COVID-19 outbreaks and some with no cases declared, but with so many asymptomatic staff and people using the services. This alone is frightening. And the prospect of catching COVID-19 is never lost on me. The fear is compounded by being a migrant with insecure immigration status and the ever-looming prospect of removal. The Home Office should recognize this dedication because this is one of the British values, I think, and that commitment to duty that I have and many other highly skilled migrants. Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State in Social Care, has repeatedly acknowledged the work my organization does and the role I do, and Home, home Office is aware of this. What other recognition can one have during this pandemic to be thanked for knowingly walking into settings with COVID-19 infected people and remaining cheerful about the job? I do wonder what will become of me should the unfortunate happen and I get sick before I'm granted IRR. The thought alone is frightening. Will I be denied secondary care? then should my status be unresolved again. Despite the doubts raised on my character with the 3225 refusal by Home Office, I cannot think of any other way that can demonstrate my integrity and a duty to a calling to help the vulnerable. I'm of a Black Asian minority ethnic group and I'm deemed to be at high risk of contra contracting COVID-19. I've not taken the option of staying at home but have continued to be at the forefront of doing this risky job. I deal with daily with the grim statistics of COVID-19 death, outbreaks and illnesses in settings every day. I talk to managers and staff who are affected and infected whilst holding it together with my own troubled immigration status. Home offices are way of my role. And I would hope that someone will exercise compassion and discretion in their reconsideration of my case. I've also continued with my community, my community involvement in numerous volunteer roles. As you know, schooling life, community worship, worshiping has changed greatly because of the COVID-19. And I've remained a rock to the community that I've lived in since 2007. I come to my family life. When you've got immigration issues, Things don't stay static. Where there is heavy problems like that, families do disintegrate. My family relationships have been strained and I've documented history of domestic abuse and sexual abuse. This was worsened over the years and the latest during my application of IRA in 2016. I'm happy in a way that I'm working to restore my relationships with my family and now I've got uh, reconnected to my children. This has been important to a degree with my mental health and the stability it brings. 
Home office is a way of that family life. But when we hear of America, when they talk separation of parents from children, it's such a taboo, but it is happening on this ground. I have not been able to travel since 2016 because my passport is with the Home Office and my issue remains undecided. My father is crossed with cancer and I would have wanted to be with him in 2019-2020 but could not travel as my case is yet to be concluded. This is just not unique to me. I have missed many, many family events, most importantly funerals, which culturally you wouldn't want to miss the cultural rights that goes with funerals and life has not been easy. Coming to long debt from unemployment, Home Office stopped me from working in the two months. I lived on credit cards, goodwill of friends in my local community. We used to be a beggar. I'm just not a highly skilled. I've got two master's degrees behind me. I've got two first degrees, numerous qualifications, having integrated in this country. The pressures of being in debt are in. And I can only pray that I'll never be stopped from working again. Career advancement. I've proven myself as a good leader and valuable employee with my current employer. We have nothing but absolute admiration and recognition of my work ethic, quality of work, and how movement in the organization. Again, my career is stalled. As I, as, as I was out of work for 22 months when I did not have a right to work. In addition, it is exceedingly difficult to aspire and apply for bigger roles when battling with the uncertainty of my immigration status. What is it that I would want uh, the outcome of all this support that you are giving us? People do make mistakes. We go back to 2007 to that issue. How many people have made errors in their life, in their lives, and is this proportionate to what we are getting? For that, if you get a visa for 30 months, can you imagine with three children, just the cost of re renewal? Look back over the time that we've had to renew is highly skilled. 30, 45,000 in wanting to justify the right to stay in this country. I don't think anything short of an IOR would do. In my case, I've provided extensive evidence on circumstances in my life that impacted on my decision making, including documented ongoing mental health issues worsened by domestic abuse, sexual assault by an employer, fending for young children as a single parent, death of a parent, breakdown of a marriage, family disintegration, and of course the immigration issues. These, were, these issues were present during the times I submitted my immigration applications and some of the errors are also because of that. I feel the Home Office has refused to engage with these facts, just even noted by the response they have given to Catherine. Despite all the even expert reports that I've heard from healthcare professionals, those have not been engaged. I kindly ask that my application be looked at together with all those other people who are in this cohort. I do not see how I can be deemed an undesirable person to warrant removal, given all the information the Home Office has on me. I'm really grateful for you, Thank you. Thank you so much, B. I think we're all sending you our love and support and virtual hugs have been coming in. We are very grateful for your courage to share what you have. Um, and I think we've learned, we've learned a lot. We've had a real insight into what life is like. Thank you so much. Um, we will hear from Amar in, in a minute, but I just want to, to bring in Sonali now, who can help, um, who is a, a QC at Garden Court Chambers. Um, Sonali specializes in immigration law and has 28 years experience as a practitioner. Uh, she was appointed Queen's Counsel in 2018 and is also the chair and trustee of various organizations including Liberty that supports legal aid access. Um, and Sonali has also won various awards including Diversity Legal Award, Lawyer of the Year and the Times Lawyer of the Week in 2018. And um, Sonali I think 
it would be really good for us to hear from you now about what some of the legal issues are and and also what can be done in response to um, what B has just shared and what we'll hear a bit after too. Oh, thank you very much Catherine and I do want to extend my heartfelt sadness to hearing B's story and, and I know it's not a rare story and although you've sent listed all the things that I've done more recently I started out my working life in Tower Hamlets Law Centre just down the road from Stephen's constituency and Refugee Legal Centre and spent a lot of my time doing advice clinics for people in this situation and this kind of um, treatment of migrants and leaving them in um, terrible situations has been my entire experience over my entire practice and my years in practice and we do need to look for structural change I just wanted to say one other thing, which is that I always think of myself as a migrant, but I'm not. I'm the daughter of a migrant. I'm the daughter of somebody who might have been described as a highly skilled migrant. He's still alive, thankfully, 90 years old. But, um, you know, that it, it has a particular resonance for what the impact on a family would be, for as B has just described it. There are just so many things to say and not so much time. So I'm just going to focus on uh, the why are people like B in the situation that they are in whereas even though things have been bad historically they haven't they haven't been this bad and the primary target and the primary mischief of the statutory framework and the, the way in which this rule has been used in my view is the 2014 immigration act so until 2014 if you made an application for extension of leave you would have um or made an application for indefinite leave um, and if you would have your leave, your status would be protected under section 3c that i mean we talked a lot it sounds a bit technical but it's a really important point and you've addressed it in the report uh, and if you were refused because of some allegation about anything true or false or proportionate or disproportionate what you would maintain is that you'd maintain the status that you had until the outcome of your appeal against that and be, this is the really I'm saying this to, sort of with an eye to Stephen and other uh, legislators or policy makers on the call, because it's because the rights of appeal were taken away in 2014 or from effectively from 2015 and with it section 3C protection that anyone is for, at the when the Home Office makes any kind of mistake is plunged into the hostile environment and there's no remedy for that. A human rights appeal, which is what we managed to get out of the Balajagari um, judgment, effectively following on from some other cases that arose in the context of the TOEIC litigation that Stephen has already outlined. That was the remedy. That was this, the court thinking of there needs to be a solution. They need to, first of all, be act fairly, the Home Office, which is to put you on notice that they might be wanting to refuse you or curtail your leave, give you the opportunity to respond, and then, um, and then. And then if there's a further decision, that will attract a human rights bill. But that wasn't the, the story for until 2019. So for people who have been waiting from 2014 to, um, onwards, they will be plunged into the hostile environment. And that's what needs to change. And it could change relative, you know, it will require legislative change, but it could change. That architecture was um, that created the hostile environment simultaneously did away with rights of appeal and the Home Office what, and what you have instead is judicial review, which is expensive, doesn't ordinarily preserve your rights um, and, you know, that it, and it exposes people to great risk of costs. And so Balajagari was a judicial review because that group had no option. And the way we I became involved in that case was to represent, we had at least over 100, 125, I think, group of highly skilled migrants who clubbed together effectively to try to get into court to persuade the court of the argument and until we came to court it wasn't the way that the app the individual cases were being put we were saying this is the impact if the people if people are refused ILR they have nothing whilst they're waiting for their remedy they have nothing they can't work they can't study they and if they don't if ultimately um, they can't obviously they can't claim benefits and then and if you refuse people ILR, it has a consequence on the nationality of their children, for example, because if the ch parents acquire indefinite leave to remain, children who are born here then become British. But until that moment, apart, you know, absent other 
situations they don't so the refusal of ilr had such huge um consequences procedurally and um strategically and and so that is why i say that it it is and one of the submissions made to the court was that the refu use of two three two two five was a sledgehammer to crack a nut and it's not that's not to be disparaging to people's individual circumstances but what it shows you it is a wholly disproportionate use of a discretionary rule so you have that rule which is there for people who are undesirable terrorists and so on um and i think stephen's point that he made about the ordinary practice of the tax department with the hmrc was something we raised in our case we filed a, a report from a tax inspector who said yeah we wouldn't normally we'd normally permit amendments just and allow remedy uh, discrepancies to be remedied and tax owing to be paid that's just how the tax system works so for it to have been taken and run with by the home office shows that there was a a targeting in a in a in a way that is similar in my view to some of the way in which the windrush um the windrush scandal evolved we know from the windrush scandal that the home office had that low hanging fruit target uh, and that is what we've seen here. I, it, the evidence speaks for itself. And so just coming back to how do you deal with this, that we, we have to have an immigration system that, uh, that recognises that the Home Office will always make mistakes, let alone the targeting or discriminatory targeting, but they always make mistakes. That's why we had rights of appeal. And the ab abolition of the right of appeal fails to recognise the systemic impact of the unfairness of that and so that is a real if you wanted to campaign on one single issue this sort of this is for the, for people here then what you want and this isn't just because i'm a lawyer this is because actually our whole system works on the rule of law that's what it, it underpins all of our societal systems we want um we want to emphasize the rule of law and that's why um real remedies that give you rights of appeal are really uh, um, in, important for this group. Sorry, I've just got the, the wrap-up message and I'm really happy to answer um, any questions. And the other point some, that was also raised was about fees. And just one observation on fees, which is there is some litigation going on about the profiteering of, uh, from the Home Office on fees. At the moment, that's focused around children. But hopefully that will may or potentially could at least lead to some further um, work on that and maybe evolution of that policy. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. That's a really, really important point. I think um, there is a huge amount of money that this community has spent on fees for visas and um, big issues that we haven't even spoken about, like citizenship for their children, and they're not, not granted that. So thank you so much for all of your support as well. So so far and you intervened in the Bala Jagari case in 2019 and helped bring that that decision that it was unlawful the process and really grateful for all your wisdom I know there's there's a question that's coming in and but I think um around kind of abolishing the Immigration Act but if you're able to stay until the end Sonali it'd be great to to do to come back to that I'm really keen as well that we um we hear from Amar as well, who is another member of the community and different situation to be, but um, similar patterns there. And then we'll hear from Salman if he's with us from Pakistan. Uh, he's with his family at the moment, um, who is the secretariat who runs the group. Um, hopefully hear from, from them and then we'll have a time for a, a Q and A. So um, we'll make sure we leave enough time. So I would really appreciate you guys if you could spend just five minutes i really apologize for that amar are you there hello there hello everyone good afternoon right uh, uh i is recording my case i want to start saying that uh thanks everyone Catherine and salman and steven and sonali everyone whoever is attending the meeting right basically Regarding my case, I want to tell you that uh, I was uh, in. It was happened that discrepancy happened in first year of my self-employment. Uh, basically, I'm not from a uh, accountancy or a background or anything like that. So I'm completed science. So so in the first year of the self-employment, unfortunately, I haven't got any knowledge of what I'm 
uh, I'll have to file this tax return because I because I was it was my first year, so I've used my cousin who was working for an accountancy firm. So he has taken the responsibility and he has uh, filed my tax returns, which unfortunately ended up in the mess. Uh, he has like misunderstood my tax returns as a, like a limited company. The self employment was treated as a limited company and and it ended up in the wrong way. So which was actually uh, rectified before someone told me of either HMRC nor home office. No one has told me that there is wrong and whatever, but it was me who identified it, me and my accountant, and we have rectified it and we, it was well and right before my application. Uh, uh, and other other years of self-employment, when I was using an accountant, there was no errors and there was no issues at all. So that was the only first year of my uh, self-employment was an issue. So I have to uh, uh, amend the uh, cal the uh, my tax returns and the HMRC accepted the amendment and they didn't even give me any penalty. They said they have they can do it as per the uh, the regulations and they just charged me some interest which is very good I've, I paid it off everything it was fine and then after uh, I have to uh, sorry <laughs> then after I have to do three applications one by one because I've in during my first application I've told home office they didn't even ask me they only asked do you do self-employment I said I can I've done it and and they didn't even ask about an amendment or thing but myself to be fair to be fair with the home office i told them there was an error happen in my old tax returns which i've rectified it and they didn't even know that i have, i have to tell my myself to be fair with them so which they've taken it in the wrong way and they said that because of this we'll have to uh, reject my application which i've spent almost like around more than 2 grand for that within within 15 days I have to put another application again <clears throat> again spending another two three grand for that and another spending uh two three grand for my wife and our nhs fees and all these things i have to do another application this time we have my associate has put up all the documents clearly so the friends and what happened even my cousin later on which who who filed my tax returns he has phoned in in front of a solicitor and he has sent me a copy from India, which he has, he, which he has moved back to India after his uh, certain period spending in the UK. So he has uh, sent me a document saying, uh, affidavit saying that he has done the error and explained everything. And I, I, I even given this uh, document to the home office during my third application of ILR. So after all this pain, I went, I have to go to the court, even they didn't consider that. They didn't even consider the question that they given me, I filled it up in during my third application. So I have to go to the court and the FTT allowed my appeal based on the human rights and they agreed with the error. And this, they have, the FTT judge has done some balancing exercise and considered the human rights and they allowed the appeal. Unfortunately, uh, Home Office challenged it to the uh, upper tribunal and I have to go there and the upper tribunal judge uh, and the uh, upper tribunal judge was uh, saying that uh, I've, I've been using people of my family to save me, which was unfair because I, I told him that he, my cousin, he was experienced and he charged me less. So he was working for accountancy firm. So that I'm, I'm not blaming. It, he completely took it in the wrong way, my my explanations. And so how it went, it didn't go well in the upper tribunal. And it so he has refused my, rejected my appeal in the upper tribunal now. So I'm going through a lot of pain. I've spent like around 25, 30 grand so far with the barristers, applications of my family. Even my son, he's like three and a half years now. And he, due to our depression, depression, he's got some learning difficulties. Even the school co co uh, contacted us saying, we need to contact the healthcare worker and we, we are in touch. We are, we are waiting for an appointment with the pediatrician now and we are in a lot of debts and to and destitution actually we ha i haven't got any criminal record i don't have work rights 
and upper tribunal judge unfortunately didn't do the balancing exercise. I'm in a highly profession. My wife is a dentist, I'm a pharmacist, and we are like completely in my our future is in blank. And I don't know, uh, this is going to too much of stress and stuff at the moment. And lots of debts, I don't know how am I gonna, I can't even leave the country because I don't want to cheat anyone because I have borrowed many, many people, including the banks. I, don't, I just don't want to leave. I want to, I want home office to get my visa sorted because there's four, more than four years of stress like ruined my life and my career of my, mine and my wife. So if home office, I, oh, I hope they, something will be sorted out because I'm waiting for permission for the court of appeal to be, uh, to be here. My case in the court of appeal. So, so once some, something comes positive, so I have to. Uh, it takes me some lots of time to clear all my debts and to re resume my life normal. I hope the dignitaries in the meeting. Uh, take this to upper level with the judiciary ministries and the home and home secretaries. And not only mine, there are many other people in the group. I hope everyone finds some light in their life in near future. And that's all I want to say at the moment. Thank you everyone. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. Thank you, Emma. I, I think you again have really powerfully shown us just what the Home Office don't know. I don't think they know what's happening. Uh, their statement yet last night to us was that nobody is destitute, nobody has any problems, everybody has the right to work. So I think they are very out of touch um, with the reality. And thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank um, you. Thank you, Emma. Um, Salman, are you there? <laughs> um, or Inam? If not Salman, Inam, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Inam. Perfect. Um, there's a few minutes left because I'd love to have um, time for Q&A, but it'd be really wonderful. You are one of the three or so secretariat members of the Highly Skilled Migrant Group. I don't know how you guys support. There was at least 400 people that you're still in, well, you're still in touch with them, at least 400 people. Lots of those people's uh, cases have been sorted out. Um, but the, these are the remaining, you know, 200 people or so who are affected. Thank you for all the work that you do. And it would be really great to hear just a few points from you so that we have time for some questions. Thank you, Inam. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for organizing all this. Uh, uh, and thank you to all the participants, uh, especially from the members of parliament. Uh, as has best been summarized by all of you, uh, I would just like to add a little bit about myself and how we uh, got engaged to this group, uh, what came to our mind to uh, form this group. Uh, I worked in the public sector for uh, over 10 years and while I was abroad due to an emergency, uh, one of my tax returns was filed by my accountant in my absence. And later on, after some time, I realized like you know, there was some error in it and the accountant realized it. And uh, he himself uh, apologized for it and corrected the mistake gave me a letter of apology and everything. Uh, but you know what uh, the Home Office is usual. They refuse my application, not knowing I'm a, working for the public sector and working for the vulnerable children. And there is entirely, uh, like there is no error in throughout my life. And there was a genuine reason I was out of, the, out of the country. It was not submitted by myself, but by a third party. But due to that Immigration Act 2014, they took away my right to work. I've been stopped working and literally with the children with additional needs and how to survive without right to work it's without like right to work mean right to live you been taken away to cut it short i, I went to the court and uh, without right to work even and then the court allowed uh, my appeal and i'm being declared honest during that time i met uh, a few other guys on the social network and they were facing a similar situation uh, got in touch with the MPs, uh, Jessica Phillips, Jess Phillips, MP, and Stephen Thames and many others. And then we started a campaign uh, against this injustice. Because when I was declared innocent from the court, Salman uh, was declared innocent from the court. We thought there is something really going on very wrong. And the time I faced, like when I was having no right to work, so 
and Salman faced the same thing. And we thought like we should bring this issue up to uh, the the people where it mattered. I would just give a very small example. Back in 2007, 2008, I was here in the UK. And when the MPs declared incorrect expenses, uh, maybe, uh, I'm sure they're all aware, but they have not been declared dishonest. They said, okay, it's a, if they can just willing to pay, they can pay it. Well, 170 MPs those were. Uh, and later on, there are many other ways, but actually there is a, the, the flow in the system, uh, which uh, you've all explained really well. Um, when we formed, this gro uh, formed that group, we then uh, at, uh, went to London for six times, we did the protest. And we asked the Home Office to give us a response to uh, uh, what they have responded to, like they have the right to work, they have the right to appeal. We, we asked them to review the cases, but they, uh, there was a debate in the parliament in June 26, uh, 2018, which Stephen's uh, team also attended along with 60 other uh, cross uh, parties MPs, they attended the, the, the debate. And they promised the, the then uh, Home Secretary, uh, Sajid Javid, and the uh, uh, Immigration Minister, Caroline Nooks, uh, right honorable uh, member of the parliament, they promised to, to publish a review. And then they, later on, they uh, delayed the review. They said, we will give uh, the proper response after the biological judgment. And till now, it's really heartbreaking to see uh, most of the members are still struggling. Uh, you have heard quite a few stories uh, from the members, like they've been uh, made destitute by the Home Office. Uh, like I can give my own example. My life is not uh, came to normality because I've, uh, I've visited so many uh, solicitors and barristers and they uh, increased the fees by four to 500 times. Just like the, the, the application fees, there's been, uh, it was only 400 day time and now it's nearly 3000 pounds. So the, the barristers, they were charging like, 400 pound to attend the hearing they are now charging 7000 pound catering 7000 pound to attend a 45 minutes hearing they uh, when even you go and visit a barrister they say oh is it a 3225 case is it a tax case or you know your fees will be different than the others because they know the low hanging fruit they are highly skilled they they must have uh, they have lived in the country for over 10, 14, 15 years. So they are not going out of this country so that we can charge any money we want. Uh, so the poor, uh, these uh, immigrants, the highly skilled immigrants, they are doing everything uh, they could to, uh, to stay in this country. And they want to live here with dignity. They want to contribute here. Like I, I don't see any of them will be relying on the public funds because they never did in the past. Um, so uh, I want uh, all the parliamentarians and the listeners on this call to end this misery for uh, these highly skilled migrants, give them the, the dignity they deserve, give them the stability they, they deserve. Like they have been through uh, lots of stress before and you cannot have uh, like the punishment more than once. If they have made any error in the past, they, they have uh, paid the, the taxes, the interest they have owed to the HMRC, and they have already been uh, in waiting for over five years. So I would just urge them to grant them them and definitely leave to remain. And I really, uh, once again, I thanks every single person to, who attended this call and uh, hoping to help the, the rest of the group. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inam. I think you raise a really important point about the legal fees as well, which I didn't mention earlier. Um, there do seem to be quite a few opportunist um, barristers and lawyers. Nali, maybe you can give us insight into that. I don't know. But why, uh, why is everybody increasing their fees dramatically as soon as they know that it's this particular type of case? Um, I, yes, Sonali, please. I've heard about that practice. It, it is inexplicable apart from greed because there is no justification for saying uh, because of this type of case I will charge you more money I mean I definitely have heard that from good authority from several of my clients but it does you know albeit there isn't a fixed fee for any particular case there's no in general terms you can't say well because it's this case I'm going to charge you more even if you have got even if it is an appeal and to emphasize that you can't you can get legal aid for human rights appeals, but you have to go through a lot of hoops to get them. Exceptional case funding, which is particularly difficult, 
because you, if you're living with a friend, ordinarily your friends is regarded as someone who's supporting you as opposed to you actually being destitute, otherwise destitute. So there are there are obstacles to getting representation, but um, I, I just abhor that practice. Yeah, it is very, very worrying. And I, I wonder, Sonali, maybe this is the best question for you, but I'll also um, it'd be good to get your thoughts in Am as well. If anybody has any more immediate questions, please do just put them in the chat. I can stay around for a few minutes longer, but just in the immediate five minutes plus that we have remaining. Um, Sonali, I think there was a point about can we revert the 2014 Immigration Act? Um, there's also points around compensation um, that that's been raised already. And there's also a really excellent point from Alexandra about perhaps the Equality and Human Rights Commission should extend their inquiry. Um, three slightly different points there. Um, I mean, yeah. I think in terms of changing the act, I mean, it's not a, given that it was introduced, it could be revoked. I mean, what the reason that was given by the government at the time was to make to streamline rights of appeal. That's what they said was happening. But in fact, it was fundamentally changed to only being an appeal where you have a refusal of a human rights claim as opposed to an immigration application. Now, because we're post Brexit and back to the point that others have made, we do need to have a functioning immigration system that would not disincentivize people to come here. And if you don't think you're going to be treated fairly and it's going to cost you a lot of money in litigation fees and judicial reviews and you don't have a right of appeal or challenge, when we know historically the Home Office have made so many errors, then that is that is a way to lobby for change and say, just give us the rights of appeal back that we had before or something like them. Now, they were complex because there were lots of different ways that you described and, and defined an immigration decision. But you could quite easily say for people making immigration paid immigration applications that they should have rights of appeal. That's If you're going to charge them a lot of money, which is disproportionate, then there's a justification there to introduce that. So that's one thing. Um, sorry, the other question was... Apologies, no, that was a lot. Yeah, compensation yeah, no. and then extending the Equality and Human Rights Commission the inquiry. Compensation, you can, I mean, so people, what people could and should be doing is potentially seeking seeking Human Rights Act damages. Now, we'd, we're working on cases like that in the context of those TOEIC victims, um, uh, the, the language testing people who could who showed that they'd been wrongly refused and the impact it had on um, it had on their earning and studies and so on, lost fees, lost earnings and that. But and you, so you can you can claim Human Rights Act damages as long as you get a move on in relation to that. But the problem with it is you have to show that there's been a breach of your human rights so it would work for people who've been wrongly refused, i.e. who who's didn't have tax discrepancies. It's maybe more difficult, although not impossible, to say, well, you called into character, called into question my character, even though for everybody else, you allow them to make tax amendments. So it's a more sophisticated argument, not impossible. I think the analogy with MPs' expenses is really apt. Um, and I think that's a good way forwards. And in terms of uh, the EHRC, I mean, they, I, I think that they, the Home Office dem is demonstrably in need of to be further investigated as to what was the driver for that policy, along with the policy for um, removing rights of appeal. And, um, uh, and you know, about just and the final question in relation to fees was that you know, I'm old enough to know we, that fee, we haven't always had fees for immigration applications they only they were introduced about 20 years ago it's, of course you might want to say that there needs to be a system to cover the cost but not to profit make out of it um and in mm -hmm. terms of disincent i know that so i'm looking at the chat quickly that mm -hmm. disincentivize point yes the government does want to disincentivize certain types of migration but it's actively saying we want to attract certain people through the ordinary routes and it's going to be dysfunctionally difficult because they're not doing sector based they've expressly said no sector based migration therefore each individual person who wants to come will have to apply for a visa or their employer will have to get a permit or something like that and we're going to be that's going to be a, a real problem and without remedies for mistakes made then it's very unattractive and i wouldn't wouldn't migrate if i thought if the home office made a mistake I could, i'd have to go to 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 the high court to remedy that mistake when i could just it should just be an ordinary appeal Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nali, for that and for your expertise um, in responding. That's really, really helpful. Um, 
we have a, a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to give one more word to Inam. Is there any one last thought you want to share with us on behalf of the Highly Skilled UK group? Inam, if you're still there. <laughs> Maybe Isam. If you, oh, Inam, you are there. Yes, I'm here. Um, uh, I would just like uh, uh, to say again uh, that, uh, first of all, the right to work, the immediate uh, stay that's, uh, that should be granted, like what Stephen Sim has said. But I would just say, instead of going round and round in a circle, I would just request them to grant them the end of the leave to remain in their misery. And... Uh, uh, you, you know how I've been through this and I know how it feels when you don't, you have to choose between the food and the legal fee and whether you just think you just go back to your country having a label of dishonest person. So I know how it feels. So I would just uh, request the authorities to ground them indefinitely for men immediately. And, and thank you very much for arranging all this there. On behalf of the highly skilled migrants, uh, I really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Inam, and thank you, Sonali, and Lord Woolley, and Stephen Timms, and everybody, and B and Amar who have spoken. Um, we can see that it's a particularly difficult time for you, and we do, we really do support you. And I will be working hard um, to, yeah, to share. And note from Francine. Reminding again, yeah, everybody, we are sending you both a big hug and, and to the rest of the community that's on the call. And I know there's other people here, such as Goldsmiths University, the Immigration Clinic, who will potentially be helping or hoping hoping that they will be helping us with this as well, and that this has been a good insight. Um, and thank you as well to any MPs and staff who are joining us. Um, Dorian, this is very sneaky. As our CEO of MRN, do you want to, to wave us out or say one word? If you are there, Dorian. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. That's the first time I've had to say that this call. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm personally pleased that we've brought this to a far greater arena and attention than ever before. Uh, and as far as uh, MRN are concerned, this is a group which are being brutalized by, by Home Office policy and quite unfairly. And the sooner that we can make people's lives have been affected by this particular legislation that much better. I think the happier I will sleep. Uh, I had to confess until Catherine came along and started looking into this, I was probably as innocent in terms of knowing what was going on with this particular group as I'm sure a lot of you are. And we will do our utmost, not just following, uh, following the publication of the report today to make sure that there's wider dissemination and that there is a really strong campaign to make sure that the Home Office undo this pernicious behaviour to these totally innocent people. So with that, I'll hand back over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Dorian, and thank you to everybody. Um, one note, the report is, will be hitting your inboxes soon. If you did sign up um, via the Eventbrite, it will be reaching your inboxes. I also so I think I've put my, in the chat, there's my email and in my uh, name, in my video, there's my email as well. So if, please just email me if you'd like to receive a copy of that and speak further if you have any more ideas as well. Uh, there's also a recording, we have been recording, so there's a recording of this event that we will share too. Uh, thank you everybody for your time. Um, I'm amazed that there are so many of you still and very, very grateful. Um, and thank you, yeah, Sonali and Am and B and Amar and uh, Stephen and Lord Willie, I think that's everyone. Um, all colleagues at MRN as well. Thank you so much. Have a really, really good afternoon and we'll be in touch shortly. Now we have a great base for momentum to go forward. I will be around for a few more minutes just to see the, see the chat, but thank you so much to everybody and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. This is like an ego exercise for me now. <laughs> I'm not staying on just to be thanked, I promise. <laughs> Catherine, you are the best.
No, stop it. <laughs> I can see Zainul and uh, there's a few others here as well. Good that, good that Bonnie joined as well. Bonnie runs a really big Facebook group on these kind of issues, so that's really good. Um, There we go. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Malia, I think I think you're free to close us down. Are we? I thought we were going to have a post. We will, but let's do a Google Meets. <laughs> <laughs>